Tank fly boss walk jam nitty gritty. You're listening to the boy from the big bad city. It's DJ Jazzy Jack. And it's Fighting on Pie Podcast episode 156. Coming at you on an absurdly slow Thursday. Um, not an awful lot going on at all. Well, we got a UFC event and a one event, which is what we're going to talk about today. But just scanning through the news, fuck all is going on. The big piece of news this week is that Donald Trump Jr. is going to see, going to the Colby Covington fight. I read that, I was like, oh, Donald Trump's going to the fight, that's a big deal. Um, but no, just just Donald Trump Jr., just the useless gummy fuck that no one cares about. I mean, at this point, like, Colby's gimmick is that he does things that he knows are lame so that people get angry. It's the whole I'm just pretending to be retarded thing, uh, jokes on them. Donald Trump Jr. has to know that, surely, or or maybe he thinks that that part's genuine. Whatever the case, if you're going and you want to throw garbage at uh, Colby Covington, I normally discourage this because you might hit someone in the front row if you don't make it far enough. If you throw it here, you're going to hit someone who deserves it, be it Colby, Donald Trump Jr., part of Trump Jr.'s security detail or friends. That's literally the only interest <laughs> or intrigue on this card at the moment. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about the card now because there's fuck all else to talk about. Actually, let's do the one card first because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to give them coverage. You know, I like one. I like their fighters. I think the whole thing is that it is just uh, uh, legally distinct from but similar to a Ponzi scheme. There is no return on anyone's investment, but they keep getting more and more capital thrown into them so they can keep paying good fighters, which is good for the spectacle and the, the actual cards while they're here. Hilarious thing happened today. Uh, D- DJ announced his weight on Twitter with, with like no pictures or anything. Just, yep, I'm one at 138. And all these fawning fans like, yes, one have fixed weight cutting, baby. And you're like, no, not even a fucking picture. What are you talking about? Um, cause that's, that's one. You just say what you weigh and uh, it's done on a, on a handshake and an ass slap. But you got some stuff going on in this. Um, one card. It's it's like 16 fights. Hold on. Oh no, 15 fights. There you go. I eyeballed it and then I checked the numbers on Tapology and I was right, almost. In terms of interesting stuff going on, you got a couple of the uh, the old school boys from Team Lake in Edward Kelly and Honorio Bernario, which is an amazing name that I'm saying wrong, but a great great name nonetheless. Uh, they're both fighting on the card. Was um, was it Bernario or Kelly who was a champion at one point? I cannot remember. Uh, but one of them was like Team Lake's first champion. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, uh, Edward Foliang or um, Kevin Bellignon, you know, the, the guys we know. That's what's going on. They they hired Arjan Buller, which is great. Uh, I thought he looked all right against Juan Adams, but then I saw Juan Adams against Greg Hardy, and I was like, oh, maybe Arjan Buller's really bad. <laughs> he's uh, uh, he's cool because in that fight he was hitting him with his head a lot, which you know is obviously uh, a slacky favourite, and uh, also he had his style listed as Kushti which is the Indian wrestling, you know, in the sand with the bugs biting you and the chance of getting dysentery. Um, but it's badass. I mean, I always tell the story of Billy Robinson when he fought the, or oh, sorry, when he wrestled the Kushti champion. And he, like, one of his things was when you put your hands on the mat in referee's position, turtle when you're getting up, whatever you want to call it, um, he always had his fingers curled under, like doing the leopard fist, you know, from Kung Fu. Um, and, and when people asked him about it, he'd be like, because I, I wrestled this Kushti guy. And as soon as we started, he reached around the side, grabbed my little finger and just pulled it back towards him. Um, but Kushti's awesome. Like they do all the, they're mad about their, um, calisthenics and stuff. They do, uh, dance, which are, uh, cat push-ups, whatever you want to call them, dive bomber push-ups. Hindu push-ups is, is what they're often called because of the Indian connection. They do lots of squats and they do stuff with Indian clubs. You know, when, um, that was a thing that the Iron Sheikh used to do, even though he was, uh, Iranian. Was he Iranian? Yeah. Uh, and, and he'd bring out the clubs and people would be like, wow, that's weird. Uh, but now people do them all the time everywhere. So uh, pretty cool. And the mace, the the great gamma used to use a mace. But anyway, enough about Kushti. I just wanted to talk about Arjun Buller so I could talk about Kushti. Obviously, uh, Indian guy, but by way of Canada. So he gets his poutine at the 7-Eleven. He's fighting some I- Italian guy with more fights than him, actually. So yeah, let's have a look. Um, uh, the, the number one heavyweight in Eastern, in, in Western Europe, apparently, according to Tapology on their regional rankings. Uh, Yuya Wakamatsu is back to fight uh, Geiji Eustachio. Oh, it was Eustachio who was the uh, the one-time uh, bantamweight champion in one. Yeah, one, like 2000 and... Th- yeah, like 2012 to 2017, I have no idea what was going on in one. I started watching 
basically because Bibiano Fernandez was on their cards, and then I started getting more into it recently because obviously we've got to do... Well, uh, there's stuff happening there now, which is why I'm watching it, but um, another Team Lake guy, and Team Lake don't really have boring fighters as far as I can work out because uh, they're a Wushu team. I keep saying I'm going to do uh, a Filthy Casuals guide. I kind of want to do more like a documentary thing. Well, not documentary thing, but like a, a mini-doc thing. Um, maybe just harvesting all of one's footage from their glossy docs and then doing all the an- analysis in between. Um, I don't know. I-, I do like them a lot, mainly because they're just doing different shit. You know, it-, it hacks me off no end in MMA when people are like, yeah, but when you meet a good blah, that's what happened. When guys lose, because they've been making a weird style work and they met someone who who filled the holes in that style or, or their specific game matched up well with them and then it's just well no no one should even try that anymore because it didn't work that one time (laughs) very pessimistic people mma fans and i say that as probably the most cynical mma fan there you got danny king dad and reese mclaren fair enough actually you you and wakamatsu versus uh esther kyo is is that's a fun fight i was i was pretty impressed by wakamatsu in his um fight with dj last time out but then getting into the main card, the people we actually know, Demetrius Johnson is fighting Tatsumitsu uh, Wada, the only Wada present in uh, one's product. <laughs> Maybe that's what chatri has been doing. Maybe by keeping Tatsumitsu Wada around, he can claim that fighters on his cards have been Wada tested. Will Demetrius Johnson pass the Wada test? Almost definitely, unless he's lost a real step or Wada is much better uh, in this fight than what he has been in the past. I mean, he's 20, 21 and 10. You don't even need to know a lot about him just to know that if you've got 10 losses in 30 fights, ew, Demetrius Johnson is probably going to find a way to do you. Really, the only interest in this fight is that Demetrius Johnson and Matt Hume and people are claiming that there's no conflict of interest because Matt Hume's not going to be in his corner. And then some on my Facebook was telling me that he knows Matt Hume, or he he knows Matt Hume to be a good guy, and Demetrius Johnson's a very good fighter anyway, so he wouldn't need the scale tipped for him. So that, that, that means there is no conflict of interest. That's not what a fucking conflict of interest is. A conflict of interest is having two interests, and they come into conflict in you trying to perform them, or look after them. Matt Hume, in keeping the rules and training and managing the judges and the refs in one, that comes into conflict with him also being the head coach of two of one's biggest fighters, or biggest name fighters. There's no way you can spin Matt Hume being a good guy to change that, you know? And I do believe Matt Hume's a good guy. We we owe him a lot, you know? Uh, anyone who's ever trained with him he says he's amazing. Him training with some sheikh in Abu Dhabi is the reason we have the Abu Dhabi Combat Club Championship, which is the best no-gi uh, tournament in the world every two years. Um, and, and basically, like, my life shuts down for that week while I watch it. But he did also lose, quote-unquote, lose a pancreas match to Ken Shamrock by Northern Light Suplex. You know, it's, a, it's just a bad look all round. But Demetrius Johnson was like, Matt Hume's not in my corner, you know, just to keep it fair. And you're like, that's that's not how that works. If he's walking around talking to the judges while you're fighting, that's probably worse than him being in your corner. But anyway, whenever people say like, oh, this Tetsu whatever Yada, Wada, is uh, taller than Demetrius Johnson, I think one's pulling some fuckery here. You're like, really? You think they're rules and regulations and judges and ref guy and matchmaker as well, which is another conflict of interest, is going to have his guy fucked over rather than the other way around. Anyway, then you've got um, Eddie Alvarez versus Edward F- uh, Fuliang, an actually interesting fight. Um, Eddie Alvarez obviously rebounding from that uh, horrible loss to Nasty Yukin where he ate a Shoryuken uppercut. And Edward Fuliang coming back from a, a very strange loss to Shinya Aoki. If you saw their first fight, he was uh, doing very well, stuffing Aoki, outlasting Aoki. Aoki obviously like the grappling equivalent of Conor McGregor. Like He just puts it all out there on the first round, and if he doesn't get it done, he's like, oh shit, I've got to start the next round standing. He gets very deflated, and he also tires himself out, because he's very strong on the ground, but he is muscling dudes around. You know, as technically as, as he is, he's still using a lot of strength. The dude passes other guys' arms up their back, and like wrenches them while he's passing guard. But yeah, Foliang, uh won the belt from Aoki back in 2016, uh, had a defense, Fort Martin win, we know that Martin Wynn is my boy. We'll be talking about him plenty in the main event, but Martin Wynn starched him, won the belt from him. Wynn ends up vacating the belt uh, after uh, Fuliang's 
chalked up a couple of wins since then. And then in uh, November of 2018, Foliang fights Emir Khan. Not that Emir Khan, but another Emir Khan, who's actually pretty good. You should check him out. Uh, I think he's the one with the with the um, twitch. Like, he has a thing, or he used to have a thing that he did, like, with his neck when he was fighting. Um, but, yeah, g- good fighter, and uh, Foliang beat him by decision in, in November. But then Foliang fights Aoki again, and ends up getting arm triangle choked in round one. And it was really weird. It was the same night that Kevin Bellignon uh, lost to Bibiano Fernandez in the most recent one, and they both just looked like they had no idea what they were doing on the ground. And it was super weird, because both of them had fought these dangerous submission artists before, and been brilliant, both stopping takedowns and scrambling up. So you're going, what, what happened, lads? What happened in training? Did you just stop grappling? But Foliang, if you've not seen him before, very fun fighter. Um, team Leke, so Wushu team converted to MMA team. Um, he, he sprawls well, he stuffs good underhooks. He's a strong lad and he's pretty fucking bulky. Like, I was saying this when the fight was signed. I was like, Edward Foliang is firstly no joke. Um, and you know, he's just lost the title and, uh, he's pretty, chonk when you see him in the in the cage at least um part of that might have been because i just watched the fight with martin win and martin win is obviously coming up from a class below but i mean eddie's eddie's thing is weird because people used to be like eddie's a massive lightweight who cuts from like 200 pounds and then he just doesn't look it when he gets in the ring with bigger lightweights um so yeah fully ang chonk lad stuff's a good takedown mainly about spinning shit loves the spinning shit does a lot of lead leg side kicking um from an orthodox stance which can be a bit messy but also uh has some cool setups for his spin kick so like when martin win was pressuring him towards the fence he was doing this thing where he'd walk across himself like cross step you know um rigando used to do that a lot you know where you take your front foot say your left foot is forward you take your front foot and you step across to your right and then you continue stepping in that direction with your right foot so you use the wrong foot first uh and by doing that he'd step to his left pivot step across himself to his right and then if he wanted to he could just fire the back kick and he was he was throwing them from there and he's quick with the spinning kicks which is what's scary you know he hasn't stopped anyone in in a little while actually but almost everything he throws is like i'm going to take your head off which conversely might not help him in the in the long run picking up stoppages because you've got to be able to consistently land lesser strikes to you know be in position to hit people hard um if everything you throw is like trying to take the other guy's head off. Firstly, you're going to get tired. Secondly, the other guy is always going to be petrified and and on edge of stepping in range with you. Eddie's problem has always been closing range. Eddie's at his best when he's moving around the cage and the other guy's coming after him. But he always has had this tendency to sort of like leap in. You know, he used to do the dart a lot. Well, he still does the dart a lot. Uh, And and it's awesome when it works, like against um, the the bad Pitbull brother, whichever one, Patriki. Um... He was just making him look a fool with that. You know, Patriki would slowly follow him. He'd shoot the right down the center, step out the side. Patriki would completely miss on a swing trying to counter him. But against Nasty Yukin, he just looked um, to really be struggling to close the distance without getting countered. Uh, and really what you need to do there is get the feints going, but you can't really get the feints going convincingly unless you've got something else working. Um, you know, the, the thing about Eddie is that he's an awesome low kicker, really quite a good low kicker. If you saw him cripple Roger Huerta in like two kicks uh he, he can kick pretty good pretty well sorry um but <laughs> he just doesn't really do it much uh I think some nice step up inside low kicks or uh right low kicks might have eased the process against uh Nasty Yukin I was watching the uh promotional material for this and Eddie Alvarez is like I've been a champion of the big organizations in North America now I need to test myself and go to Asia and become the champion in Asia <laughs> and you're like no you're not you, 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 this is basically your retirement package. I love Eddie Alvarez, but he's getting long in the tooth, and he knows that. He knows that he wasn't at the top of the UFC anymore. Um, he just had a, a, a slip down the rankings after that Poirier fight, the second one, and one allegedly, according to Eddie, offered him eight figures for this total contract. You know, provided he does the fights, so he, he's just going to do that and see the see the contract out and get the money. Which is good, because he deserves it. Because, you know, with the nickname The Underground King, that's because he was fighting on, like, all these other shows, like Bodog Fight, that just aren't a thing anymore. Uh, And and he really did grind his way to the top. But I think this will be good. I think um, maybe expect more of a grindy wrestling performance from um, Eddie here. Um, I could see... See, I'm I'm just thinking I really want him to kick 
Foliang's lead leg because Foliang likes to sta- stand side on. Um, if you can slip, to, you know, this, the dart fits in quite well with the the big uh, exploitable habit in Foliang's game. Foliang really only like his boxing extends as far as like jab into overhand, but he has to change his stance to do that because he often stands side on. You know, he's square when he's worried about stopping takedowns, but he spends a lot of the time just getting into position to spin. Uh, or being in position, ready to throw like a sidekick. But the the big thing about the uh, turning kicks, side kick, uh, sorry, turning side kick, back kick, uh, wheel kick, whatever, what have you, turning kicks off the back leg, um, and and spinning back fists and things too, is that if you stick to their ass crack, or probably better just to stick to their lead hip, consider like their butt uh, a revolving door, the space in a revolving door. If you just follow it round with them. You know, you're you're gonna avoid the kick. Uh, T.J. Dillashaw did this to Head and Burrell several times. You know, if you know if you know that guy likes spinning for kicks, and you can get a read on it, step to your left, or you know, step down the side of of the the side that they're turning to, uh, turning to, turning away from. Step away from the kick, basically. Um, and Martin Wynn did that to Foliang, and he just went down the side and cracked him with a, a overhand right on the way past. Uh, one of the most incredible knockouts you'll ever see. We did a big piece on Martin Wynn at, uh, for the Patreon boys. I was gonna do, uh, I was thinking about doing a Filthy Casuals guide for it this week, but then I thought, nope, did a big piece for the Patreon boys. Let's keep that for the Patreon boys just for now. Um, but yeah, I, I really like Wynn. Uh, we're gonna talk about him in a minute in the main event, but kicking Foliang's lead leg, sliding down the side when you can read the, uh, turning kicks coming. Parrying the, the sidekick. I mean, he's got a very quick sidekick and he can throw up a hook kick, so parrying it can be difficult. But, um, really, like, for Eddie, dealing with someone who's such a dangerous kicker, you're gonna have to either have them kick at you and then come in on the counter, or crowd them out so that they can't kick as effectively. The place you don't want to be is, like, floating around in the middle, kinda like, you know, he got sort of stuck doing against Nasty Yuken. I keep saying Nasty Yuken. Probably not his name, but I'm gonna call him Nasty Yuken. I mean, if Foliang wins that, I, I think there'll be a lot of, um, you know, ah, oh, Eddie is completely washed now. But I think, you know, really, I've liked Foliang for a long time. And, I, you know, that's not a mark of being great. I like people like um, Kizeman Saiga, and he's definitely not great. But um, I've liked uh, Edward Foliang and seen potential for him to beat very good lightweights for a little while. Um, I don't know if... He, see, this is the thing. I've seen him stuffing uh, Shinny Aoki and people like that, but... I haven't really seen him with any, against anyone with sort of a, a really top-level wrestling pedigree. But then that's the whole Team Lake A thing. It is a mystery because fighting wrestlers and trying to sprawl and brawl, the last thing you should be doing is spinning for back kicks and shit. But him and Kevin Bellignon have taken on great grapplers and <laughs> been able to just stuff takedowns and throw back kicks. Uh, it makes no sense, but it is also incredible. Then in your co-main, you got a, a Muay Thai bout between uh, Jonathan Haggerty and Rod Tang. This is the one that has me fucking hype. Um, I wrote a Jonathan Haggerty piece for the Patreon boys this week. I highly recommend you watch, uh, read it rather, because it's a pretty depthy jump into like his style and what has made him so successful. Um, because you know he's he's got less than twenty bouts. He had less than twenty bouts when he he met Same. Same is uh, a legend in Muay Thai. He had four. He has something like four hundred and thirty fights to his name. He'd lost like thirty, but you know when you see these things, it, the the really successful ties, it's like lost thirty, but a lot of them were when they were chi- when they were a child because they count all those fights, uh, and a lot of them they don't really get hurt. You know, it's just a, a close contest with no one really getting too badly hurt and, and going to the decision. You know, you could watch a dozen fights at um, one of the, the Muay Thai stadiums and, and a lot of them guys go, don't get hurt too badly. They're typically pretty good because of their uh, proficiency in the clinch and so on. Good guys against good guys very rarely ends in, like, big knockout. I think that partly sort of hurts um, Muay Thai's uh approachableness approachableness from you know from the outside you can put in like two of the best names if they fought each other you put it into youtube you watch them good close fight or or maybe one guy pulls ahead a bit wins a decision but knockouts are generally rarer than in kickboxing you know kickboxing was created to to take muay thai stuff and and karate stuff and shit and and try and manufacture more knockouts k1 was like we'll have a three second clinch rule and then they promptly realized Actually, we'll have a no clinch rule. Um, but Haggerty did marvelously against Sam A, who has seen everything 
that you will probably see in the ring. You know, 430 fights. The guy, when he gets in the ring, that's just another day at the office. That's not like... It's such an interesting thing because if you've had that many fights, like even in boxing, things like that, say Archie Moore or someone like that, when you had 300 fights on your record or whatever, that's just another day at the office for you. You are very used to fighting. Whereas... There are guys like, um, say, Jeff Fennick or someone like that who get to their... Or, or Lomachenko... Well, actually, Lomachenko had that massive amateur experience. But these guys who get into, like, the uh, a world title fight in, like, their 10th or 11th fight, and it happens a lot in MMA, you know, they are building up everything towards that one night, and it's just such a um, contrast. Particularly in Muay Thai when guys fight so often, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the training is, for your, is, is perhaps your job, and uh, you part of your job is turning up and fighting at the end of the two week three week cycle or whatever whereas in mma it's like three months i've got to get this this and this peaked in time for the fight um so anyway as we were saying Haggerty is like less than 20 fights into his career fights out of uh, team underground which i believe is an mma team but they're on old kent road bit of a rougher part of london if you uh if you know old kent road you'll probably know it from the monopoly board where it is the cheapest property um but yeah, I mean, he's by way of, like, Kettles and um, the Nolsey Academy, which used to be, uh, what was it, Minotaur Gym? Um, you know, all these established names in, in sort of the UK kickboxing game slash uh, Muay Thai game. But he's properly slick. Uh, he's, he has this outside kicking game, you know, just needling with the teeps, switch kicks, lovely switch kick on him, uh, both low, body, high. Uh, and he just uses those masterfully, even going backwards. Uh, he gets guys walking on to body kicks a lot. And that's where he sort of gets people in this frame of mind where he's going to have... It's it's kind of like if someone establishes a good jab on you in boxing, you're going, ah, fuck, I'm going to have to make a fight out of this. He's going to keep me on the outside and, and uh, out, uh, point me, out, box me, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then he'll pick up his leg to feint a kick and step in deep and start elbowing you. It, it's the, He doesn't really box that much. His main thing is like all the way out or all the way in using elbows. Uh, and his elbows are awesome. The the downward one, which isn't really downward, it's behind the head and forward. You know, I've, I've heard it called a spike elbow or a chopping elbow or some shit like that. Uh, I'm not big on Thai names for moves, but... Uh, it, rather than 12 to 6 it's forward and you know it would be called as 12 to 6 in mma but we are trying like to not call those anymore if you've noticed refs are desperate to be like actually it was one to seven or whatever there was a slight arc to it so i think p the more people just start trying this on the feet in mma the the quicker we get it adopted but if you saw his fight with the italian guy um just before the same fight he he knocked him down with this he hit same with it you know it's that overhead strike it's actually pretty tricky you know you you, you see like judo uh, books and sh and old jujitsu books and shit the the thing that they always do the defense for is like upper rising block against downward strike with a bottle or whatever from overhead uh, overhead in uh, a professional fighting bout pretty tricky angle to deal with because if you've got your arms up and they're you know by your sides or whatever you've got a, a classical guard or putting your earmuffs on or whatever you're dealing you're covered against strikes from the outside you're going to try and either move your head or, or duck or, or uh, just lean in and take strikes down the center you don't really have anything to protect you from above and that's what andy hugs axe kick did it was just it fucked with your guard because he'd throw his leg up and it come down so quick you'd be like shit so guys like dick rufus who are really experienced um tie boxes kickboxers start lifting their arms up getting their elbows away from the body and he's putting them down with body kicks it was uh, something weird to open up openings for another thing. Uh, and Haggerty's elbow works a little bit like that. But he caught, like, Same with the forward downward elbow, too. It's a really slick technique. And he did a fucking ch uh, cheeky nodder into a back elbow. So he's just my boy. He's, he's incredible. But he's fighting Rod Tang, and Rod Tang is a monster. Uh, if most people are probably familiar with Rod Tang from the tension fight, where he took on this, you know, knockout-punching phenom, and took the punches and was like, what, mate? Throw more. Um, and <laughs> to, he pretty much broke tension in that fight. For, round four and five was tension flopping to the floor to get extra time. Um, he was not able to hurt Rod Tang when he was at his best, and then he faded very obviously towards the end, like he did against Swakin. But uh, <laughs> you know, the refs, the Japanese refs in Rise and uh, Knockout are not going to... Uh, punish tension for abusing the rolling thunder to to dive to the floor and then take forever getting back up or actually shoot a double as he did against rod tang rod tang is awesome can't wait to see this fight because this is the thing Haggerty 
very smooth technician, very good at keeping it on the outside, but will get inside and ugly if he wants to or needs to. Um, Rod Tang is probably going to force him to fight ugly, which is awesome, uh, I think. Sounds great. And then the main event, you've got Martin Wynn versus Kiyomi Matsushima. He's defending his, uh, it says 155, but that'll be featherweight because we're in one and it's all up 10 pounds or whatever. Uh, belt. Yeah, I like Wynn. You know, the thing we've always said about Wynn is that he doesn't really have a way to lead, which is kind of costing him because people have now picked up on the fact that if you throw obvious punches at him, he's going to knock you out with counters. Um, he added the low, low kick to his game in the last fight and uh, hobbled his man and then jumped him with a flying knee and knocked him out. I like that as a technique for him i would love to see him develop like a jab or something an inside low kick with his lead leg uh he just needs more things to like pick at dudes to make them forget and then come back at him and not forget the counter punches in the process <laughs> yeah that's the other thing if guys work on if, if guys are like counter punches and they start working on offense because their counter punching stops working as effectively because guys won't just walk in on them um they can end up getting away from their counterpunching what made them so slick in the first place. It's leading to get on the counter that is very tricky to do, but if you're very good at it, like, say, Conor McGregor, um, it, it can really... Uh, that's that's an easy way to pick up knockouts. There are two reliable ways to pick up knockouts in uh, high-level combat sports, in my humble opinion. First is pressure, just break guys under pressure, because that's more um, exhaustion than it is, like landing one good blow but uh the other one is to lead to get on the counter and score good counters that way because guys don't like you know at the top level guys don't obviously leave openings when they're leading but when they're lashing back at you after you've hit them with something or, or stung them with a quick jab or dug a body kick or whatever that's when they leave openings it's basically the two times your discipline is going to break down anyway let's talk about this ufc card it's not stellar if i'm honest um biggest name on the card is donald trump jr <laughs> but what we got lauren murphy's fighting she's all right jordan espinosa man it's oh this is rough lucy budelova i quite like her and she's fighting antonina shevchenko i would love to see antonina shevchenko lose again just because those fans are so creepy and loud uh, mickey gall is on the card fucking hell kennedy nez chukwu who you'll remember from being just dreadful against paul craig i believe he actually got out punched by paul, paul craig which is pretty startling and then he got scissor swept into a triangle choke when was that that was wow well, that was only in march but um yeah he's coming back he looked terrible what else we got hannah goldie versus miranda granger fucking hell joaquin silva versus nazrat ah there we go nazrat my boy halal gastelum as we like to call him was it silva who retired um Reza Madadi. Got Vink Pichel back in the win column. I remember that one. Yeah, don't remember much of him. And then in the co-main, co fucking hell, we got all the way to the co-main. It's like, God, there's not a lot on this card. Clay Guida versus Jim Miller. That's a good one. That one feels like it would have been good in the past and it feels like it still could be good in the present. Jim Miller, I'm so enjoying his late career, you know, and Clay Guida, you know, it's these, these two guys, like, if you compare them to BJ, which we obviously got to when Clay Guida fought BJ the other uh, month, uh, it's just that aging, you know, aging is very different for fighters and uh, Clay Guida and Jim Miller have actually aged pretty well. You know, they can still put it on young guys. Jim Miller seems to fight every weekend and I love him for it. Uh, beat Gomi back in like 2016. Uh, got that split decision over Joe Lozon in a rematch of their first amazing fight, which was all the way back in 2012. Fucking hell, that makes me feel old. Um Beat Thiago Alves, and then he had this rough streak of losses, which was Dustin Poirier, Anthony Pettis, uh, Francisco Trinaldo, and Dan Hooker. But most of those decently competitive, with the exception of Hooker, who starched him. But the, the Poirier one, to go to the majority decision, uh, you know, he lost the majority decision, decision, that is, which means that one judge saw it as a draw, and a lot of people saw it as a draw. Um, he really gave Poirier some trouble uh, with, like, the low kicks and stuff. And that was sort of like the birth of, uh, or the starting point of Poirier's really slick boxing style that he just sort of invented. But then the fight with Anthony Pettis, Anthony Pettis looked really quite on in that fight. You know, he was backing uh, Miller onto the fence and hammering him there, because Pettis always worked well along the fence and has sort of got away from that in recent years. Oh, uh, and part of that is also that guys have realised if you stay in Pettis' face, he's liable to break. Unless he Superman punches you, and <laughs> then everyone goes, well, now he belongs at welterweight. You're like, oh, does he? he? He landed a Superman punch. That's not really an a impressive performance. But, um, you know, Jim Miller got back on the on the win train after those four losses by uh, beating Alex White. That was the night of two whites when we decided those guys should not be in the UFC. Um, and... 
then you know he was he looked good against white and you're like wow there are clearly levels to this and then charles Oliveira just picked him up basically <laughs> like he he got a body lock and was like nope and lifted him up put him on the floor choked him uh and you you know years ago miller uh leg locked Oliveira, uh and we were like wow clearly levels to this but um age also has levels <laughs> and uh jim miller's getting up there in the age uh and then most recently for jason gonzalez who's enormous and that was actually a pretty cool fight because jason gonzalez is just going to come out and try and kick your head off and miller got on his back and choked him which was uh great but clay guida coming off the win over bj penn also just got slapped about by charles Oliveira. knocked out joe Lowe's on before that but that was back in 2017 you know he hasn't really done an awful lot lately what have you done for me lately clay guida um I think this one has every chance of turning into like an awkward striking match because Clay Guida, good wrestler, but does he really want to, you know, what what does he have to gain from trying to wrestle Jim Miller, who has good guillotines, good back takes, uh, good off his back, and fairly difficult to take down unless you're, you know, Charles Oliveira and monstrously strong and young. Um, so I could see a Clay Guida point fighting clinic here. Um, but Miller, you know, Clay Guida doesn't really hit, and Miller does hit, you know, that's one of the things that he's managed to carry into his later career, he still hits pretty damn hard, and if the Dustin Poirier match taught him anything, it's to kick him, slows people down, and, you know, a hobbled Dustin Poirier is not nearly as scary as a uh, confident, awkwardly shoulder-rolling Dustin Poirier. So I don't really know what's going to happen in that one, I'm more keeping an eye on that, because that has the potential to suck, um, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm cautiously excited for it. And in the main event, you've got Covington versus Lawler, which is just propping up this corpse of a card, to be honest. I like this. I like this fight. Robbie Lawler has had a rough run of late, but um, really his problems generally have been in the striking. Robbie Lawler has always been really good at stopping a takedown because he was training with Matt Hughes in his prime and, and uh, people like that. One of the better sprawling brawlers in MMA. And, you know, he went up to middleweight for a long time in strike force and he was fighting guys like Tim Kennedy, who's enormous um and you're just going well that's why you're being held down it's not that you have bad takedown defense you're fighting tim kennedy jack array you know jack array and robbie lawler think of them in the same weight class but you know he, he came down a weight class he looked really quite active off his back when he was taken down uh josh koscheck like got up from underneath him with uh, butterfly hooks and josh koscheck got tired and ended up like in the turtle on uh Lawler's leg and Lawler just stood up and hit him and I've never I you very rarely see guys get hit hard from the turtle because it's such an awkward position to try and punch um but he, he knocked him out there had that great little uh striking clinic against Bobby Volker did well against McDonald the first time and then he had the fights with uh, Johnny Hendricks which are really more important to our purpose because he really did stop a takedown like a monster in those fights first fight Hendricks really got to him with the low kicks, which was surprising because Lawler was using his head movement very well, staying away from punches and coming back with counters. But doing that, you have to stand on your feet and you, you, you're you not going to be able to check at the same time. Uh, so Hendricks hurt him with low kicks in that one. Second fight, Lawler goes to the body and just, you know, he had Hendricks clinging on for dear life at many points. Only won the split decision, but I felt like Hendricks was, you know, if we were doing pride scoring, as people always say, I think, you know, there was no question he got closer to finishing Hendricks than Hendricks came to finishing him. There was that moment where he, Hendricks is trying to hold him down or was in on a leg or something like that. And Lawler just starts elbowing his kidney. And I was like, fuck that. Fuck having Robbie Lawler legally elbow my kidney. But, you know, it was all going well up until like, well, the Carlos Condit fight was a little bit of a... Uh, aberration but up until the, the Woodley fight where he just got faked out and ate an overhand uh, but since then like he had that real back and forth war with Donald Cerrone where we were all like wait what it was only three rounds when it ended because uh, we all wanted round uh, four and five got outstruck by Rafael dos Anjos which was very peculiar just never really got going in that fight and then the Askren fight stopped Askren's takedowns hit him with hard knees ended up slipping off and, and getting um either choked or face choked depending on who you are but you know in that fight you you saw that he's very confident stopping a takedown from even a very good takedown artist still at this point you know covington like fun ground game um good passes and stuff you know it really does work when he's on top um got a little bit tired in uh couple of his fights like against what was his name something silver uh, but yeah, got a little bit tired passing the guard, but he, he generally puts a good pace on guys from the top. Catches the far wrist for the, the Habib grip, slash Dagestani handcuff, slash cross wrist, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, does that, you know, when guys try and get up. The standard wrestler toolkit. Um, his shots really just like 
throws a he, he southpaws, so he throws a left body kick or high kick, and then he shoots immediately after it. He gets guys throwing at him, and he, he shoots in. Not quite as well as Frankie Edgar, but he clearly has these little practice things he does, and he runs them towards the fence when he does so. Doesn't really have the power in his hands of, say, a Tyron Woodley. Um, I feel like that's where Tyron Woodley had so much success because he had a we was Lawler was concerned about the takedown, but that massive punch was there if he was overcommitting to defending the takedown. I feel like in this fight, Lawler can probably just commit to defending the takedown. I mean, the high kick does make you raise your hands a bit, but there's also a big gap to close there when you want to get in. I don't think Covington's going to like box into uh, takedown range and you know have. Lawler, uh, have Lawler terrified of his of his hands. I think for this fight, I'd love to see Lawler go to the body because you know everyone knows you want to take their head off with punches when they're coming in, especially for Robbie Lawler. Um, the the counter right hook, obviously very interesting because both these guys are southpaws, and a lot of Covington has uh, a lot of what Covington has been doing has been against orthodox fighters. You know, he fought RDA and um, David Meyer recently, who are both obviously uh, southpaws as well. But uh, a lot of his setups that I'm that I've picked up on watching his fights have been. Uh, using a southpaw body or head kick uh, and uh, a southpaw left straight to sort of like throw people off. I feel like, it, you know, uh, Lawler's southpaw right hook, which is his money punch, uh, could could really make a difference in a southpaw versus southpaw uh, environment. Whereas against orthodox fighters, it's an awkward angle, but it's also quite a tricky angle for him to actually land. Um, but yeah, dig into the body is what I'd love to see more of from Lawler. Uh, especially, uh, we say every episode now, it seems, but if you hit someone in the body and they're shooting on your hips at the same time, you've got the underhook already. And Lawler works well from those positions and he knees well from the clinch. You know, he, he did that to Astrin, he did it to Law, uh, Hendricks. You know, uh, knee the body from the clinch, great way to tire out wrestlers. He made Astrin give up the clinch, go back to range, and then he was like, oh shit, I literally have no other tools except my wrestling. I've got to be back in there. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, uh, it's an interesting fight. It's more like, it's basically gatekeeping. Well, Robbie Lawler is a gatekeeper, but it's gatekeeping Colby out of the title picture because he's just not that interesting as a fighter. And while his gimmick has gotten a lot of attention, um, it also just razzes people off in like sort of go away X-Pac heat. Um, so, you know, I mean, at least if he wins, Donald Trump Jr. will be there. They'll probably bring him in the cage and have a moment or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's probably the most dangerous guy that uh Covington has fought in a while not to shit on the rest of the welterweight division but generally guys have more or less um problematic skill sets specifically for a guy who's just going to try and overwhelm and wrestle Barbarina decent hands decent takedown defense but not Robbie Lawler level um Max Griffin good but again not Robbie Lawler level and Dong Hyun Kim is is obviously very strong uh wrestler and grappler but has nothing to threaten you on the feet. And then the, uh, Rafael Dos Anjos, big weakness has always been wrestlers and pressure. And Damian Meyer, if you're a wrestler, it basically isn't even a fight. You know, he doesn't do anything else. So really just like a litmus test on Colby Covington and where he is at the moment um, while we wait for... Uh, Usman's out with, what is he? Is it a shoulder injury or something? Um, but Usman's out for a little while. And uh, Woodley's fight... Oh, who's Woodley fight? Oh no, this is to replace Woodley, isn't it? Yeah, Woodley versus Lawler 2 was a really bizarre piece of matchmaking. Anyway, I mean, I've, I've rambled on about that fight, even though it's uh, not great. So uh, well, <laughs> I had a load of questions because I got sent about 20 questions this week, but I think uh, we're a little bit low on time, so I will answer some of those on Monday. If you want to get in on the Patreon, read the Martin Wynn study, the Jonathan Haggerty study ahead of the weekend, the Cyril Garn study because you like big men who switch hit, uh, and all the other stuff we do. Get on the Patreon. It allows me to do this podcast twice a week. It allows me to uh, not have a sponsor and to be completely unfiltered and just ramble about whatever conspiracy theory I have at the moment. If you want to send an email to the podcast, fights gone by podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing or have written at any point, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy Jack Slack. Wada bless.